Good morning. Welcome to Calvary Baptist Church. Um, I know you're accustomed to seeing these videos uh, with the worship team, and I apologize. I just the logistics on that are so <laughs> poorly designed that uh, I've decided to go ahead and just do the sermons and uh, hope that that's adequate for those of you that are watching online at home. Um, so, apologize for not having that available. You'd uh, look in your Bibles at Romans chapter 13. Chapter 13, verse 1 says, Let everyone be subject to governing authorities, for there is no authority except that which God has established. The, the authorities that exist have been established by God. Verse 2, Consequently, whoever rebels against the, the authority is rebelling against what God has instituted, says Paul, and those who do so will bring judgment on themselves. For rulers hold no terror for those who do right, but for those who do wrong. Do you want to be free from the fear of the one in authority? Then do what is right, and you will be commended. Verse 4. For the one in authority is God's servant for good. But if you do wrong, be afraid, for rulers do not bear the sword for no reason. They are God's servants, agents of wrath to bring punishment on the wrongdoer. And then finally, in Romans 13, verse 5, Therefore, it is necessary to submit to, to the authorities, not only because of possible punishment, but also as a matter of conscience. Today marks the 245th anniversary of our nation's independence from King George of England. It certainly has been a long and eventful journey from the colonial days of our forefathers to today, and what's in store for tomorrow, well, we can only guess. My neighbors have been shooting off fireworks since May, so it's bound to be a very festive evening tonight. The Apostle Paul's letter to the Romans was written within about 25 years or so of Jesus' death and resurrection. In it, the, ap the Apostle explains that forgiveness comes by grace for both Jews and Gentiles through faith in Jesus' sacrifice for sin. That it's not by works or even kinship to Abraham that a person is adopted into God's family, but only through Christ, God's only begotten Son. Now, based on this salvation by grace, the Apostle encourages the Romans in chapter 14 to faithfully fulfill their duties as citizens, not only of God's kingdom, but of the Roman Empire as well. Despite what must have been discouraging dissatisfaction with Roman rule, it was still important to Paul and the other Apostles as well that believers accept the state's authority as legitimate so long as it didn't interfere with their obligations to God and Scripture. The Apostle Peter says as much in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 13, Submit yourselves for the Lord's sake to every human authority, he writes, whether to the emperor as the supreme authority or to the governors who are sent by him to punish those who do wrong and to commend those who do right. In view of this year's Independence Holiday, I'd like to wind up our sermon series from the uh, Paul's letter to the Romans with a brief look at three areas regarding the relationship of church and state that Paul writes about in Romans uh, 13. In your bulletins, uh, I've outlined, uh, provided an outline, and those of you at home, I realize you probably don't have that, but beginning with uh, the relationship, or the outline begins with the relationship between God and governing authorities. Uh, the second point would be government and God's people, and third, God's people and others. Despite living under the laws of earthly political administrations, Christians are to aspire to live for a higher purpose of loving God and others, because he says in verse 8, love is the fulfillment of the law. Whatever other, other commands there may be are summed up in this one command, to love your neighbor as yourself. Therefore, love is the fulfillment of the law. So essentially, the way to fulfill one's obligation to both God and man is to love the Lord your God and to love your neighbor as yourself. Christians wrote Augustine in the 4th century, are citizens of two cities, the city of God and the city of man. This dual citizenship, he further explains, requires believers to know clearly when, where they stand in relation to their faith and the governing authorities. In verse 1 of our chapter, Paul uses a Greek term, exousia, translated authorities in the NIV, 
no less than seven times in the first seven verses with reference to the appointed government officials in his day, which would have been the Roman Empire. The word literally combines the two ideas of legal right and civil might. In the case of the Roman government, Paul says in verse 4 that it holds the sword over its citizens, and beyond that, it literally holds the sword over threats that might come against those same citizens. The military protects us from foreign enemies, and the police protect us from each other. In 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 13, the apostle Peter says, Submit yourselves to every human authority by God sent by God to punish those who do wrong and to commend those who do right. While there's little question that Christians are expected to submit to governing authorities, there is some question about how far a government's authority extends. Issues like federal abortion laws and the promotion of homosexuality as a civil right test our convictions as believers when government is used to enforce laws that are openly opposed to our biblical morality. Whatever laws are enacted with, with, which contradict God's law, writes biblical scholar John Stott, civil, civil, civil disobedience becomes a Christian duty. Whenever laws are enacted, it becomes a duty. We learned this lesson from Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., who stood courageously before a Washington, D.C. crowd in 1963 and challenged the U.S. to not govern people by the color of their skin, but by the content of their character. Dr. King quoted our nation's Declaration of Independence to make his point, saying, We hold these truths to be self-evident that all men and women are created equal. Now, I realize that it, took a great, that it took a great deal of social unrest and several nights in a Montgomery jail for Dr. King to convince our country that the time had come to extend civil rights to all people equally. But with God's help, it got done. And to the credit of this nation's sometimes reluctant citizenry, civil rights legislation was enacted by Congress and much of Dr. Dream, Dr. King's dream was realized. When Paul says in the second part of verse 1 that there's no authority except that which God established, he was acknowledging God's wisdom in using earthly authorities for the protection of citizens against lawlessness. Paul says that legitimate governments don't exist purely for human organization, but rather they're instituted and established by God. And while God was certainly has certainly established his church to carry out his plan of salvation, the Great Commission, He's also established governing authorities to maintain legitimate laws and the social order. The threefold function of human government as instituted by God is to protect, punish, and promote. It's to protect a fallen humanity from sin, to punish convicted criminals for their crimes, and to promote the general welfare of its people. Meanwhile, it's impossible for a believer to be both a good Christian and a bad citizen at the same time. Our threefold function or obligation as children of God is to, to recognize and accept the government as ordained by God, deserving of our taxation and worthy of our prayers for elected leaders. Paul adds a practical application to what he's explained in verses 1 and 2, saying in verse 3, For rulers hold no terror for those who do right, but for those who do wrong. Obeying a just government is not only the godly thing to do, it makes practical sense as well. Paul's reasoning was really very simple. Those who obey the law have little to fear from the government, while those who disobey the law can expect the authorities to enact just punishment and even retribution when necessary. In terms of a Christian's relationship to government, so long as that government upholds what is fundamental, in fundamental agreement with Scripture, we really have nothing to fear and everything to gain by obeying its rule. Likewise, so long as government's laws are in keeping with biblical morality and justice, there's nothing for that, that government to fear from its citizens, or Christian citizens anyway, and everything to gain from allowing them their freedom of religion. According to verse 4, the one authority is God's servant for our good. But if you do evil, says the latter part of verse 4 in the New King James Version, be afraid, for he does not bear the sword in vain. In essence, Paul was saying that not only should we obey governing authorities because it's the right thing to do, but, but because if we don't, 
God has ordained these governments to penalize and punish lawbreakers. If the most important responsibility of government is the protection of its citizens, and I believe that it is, then the execution of justice against those same citizens who threaten our public sa sa safety should be swift and judicious. In the latter part of verse 4, Paul describes government as bearing the sword and his agents of wrath to bring punishment on the wrongdoer. Despite a popular opinion to the contrary, Scripture is, a cl is clear that it's the government's duty to implement both capital punishment, the death penalty, and engage in defensive wars as necessary for the protection of its people's liberty. These are not my theological opinions based on my purely political considerations. They're biblical imperatives that obligate God's people and their governments to conform to the biblical guidelines of legitimate rule. Paul says that God himself has given the power of the sword to government for the punishing of public threats, particularly those threats brought on by murderers and foreign assassins. Back in Genesis chapter 9, verse 6, God instructed Noah, If anyone takes a human life, that person's life will also be taken by human hands, for God made human beings in his own image. This is a New Living Translation. Human life is sacred, not because Planned Parenthood can get cash for baby parts, but because we're created in God's image. Like many of you, I have no desire to see the most hardened criminals die without mercy. After all, there are probably a million mitigating factors that might explain their deviant behavior. But apparently, being a steward of God's authority requires that governments justly eliminate from among the living those people who insist on violating the biblical command to not kill. So when a government uses reasonable force to restrain public threats, both foreign and domestic, government is serving not only its citizens, but God. Therefore, says Paul in verse 5, it is necessary to submit to the authorities, not only because of possible punishment, but also as a matter of conscience. Interestingly, Paul's instructions about the severity of civil punishment in verses 1 through 5 are followed by his instructions in verses 6 and 7 regarding, of all things, the payment of taxes. Now, I don't think this is a coincidence or a literary cut-and-paste job. Paul deliberately and very quickly moves from heinous crimes like violent murders to lesser sins like cheating on one's taxes. Now, I think these two verses were put in Paul's letter for, the, for citizens like me, because no one wants to cheat on his taxes more than I do. For whatever reasons, I just don't like paying taxes. Listen to verses 6 and 7 in the New Living Translation. Pay your taxes too, for these same reasons. For government workers need to be paid. They're serving God in what they do. Give to everyone what you owe them. Pay your taxes and government fees to those who collect them and give respect and honor to those who are in authority. Whether we like paying taxes or not, the fact is we're commanded by God to do just that, pay our taxes. And don't cheat. Listen to Paul's words in verses 8 through 10. Let no debt remain outstanding except the continuing debt to love one another, for whoever loves others has fulfilled the law, the commandments. You shall not commit adultery, you shall not murder, you shall not steal, you shall not covet, and whatever other command there may be are summed up in this one command, love your neighbor as yourself. Love does no harm to a neighbor, therefore love is the fulfillment of the law. If our decisions about the law and how to treat others were based on our love for God, we really wouldn't have to worry about what Paul teaches in this chapter. As amazing as it may sound, if you love God, you can do as you please because you'll be doing what pleases God if you love Him the way you should. So basically, the rule of God's law comes down to this. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and keep His commandments, and you'll both please God and fulfill your duty as a citizen. There's a great story in Matthew chapter 22 where in verse 23 Jesus encounters a group of cynical Sadducees who had tried to trap him with silly questions about marriage and the resurrection. Jesus handles these self-important religious leaders so well, says Matthew, that everyone was astonished at his teaching. Hearing about Jesus' popular performance, some of the local Pharisees got together in verse 34 and tested Jesus yet again by asking him, 
which is the greatest commandment of the law. That's sort of like asking a mother which of her children she loves the most. Anyway, Jesus answers them in verse 37 saying, Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. And the second is like it, love your neighbor as yourself. All the law and the prophets hang on these two commandments. Down in verse 46, Matthew describes the people's reaction to all this by saying, No one could say a word in reply, and from that day on, no one dared to ask him any more questions. Sort of a drop the mic moment. The Apostle Paul was nothing if not absolutely a devoted disciple of Jesus every word. He knew that the Savior's single greatest message from God to God's people and from God's people to those around them was the message of covenant love. A love that Paul describes in the New Testament using the Greek term agape meaning unconditional faithfulness. Paul says in verse 10, love does no harm to a neighbor, therefore love is the fulfillment of the law. In verses 11 through 14, Paul says that considering the times they were living in, they should wake up and put aside the deeds of darkness. And then he lists some of those deeds, such as carousing and drunkenness, sexual immorality, debauchery, dissension, and jealousy. We might ask, well, what is he talking about? Was he talking about Jesus' prophecy in Matthew 24, for instance? which is also found in Mark 13 and Luke 21, that Jerusalem and the temple would be destroyed within a generation as it was in 70 AD? Or maybe he was talking about the end of the world as foretold in the book of Revelation. That's when everything just sort of falls apart. It's really kind of hard to say, but whatever the case, the apostle instructs his readers in verse 14 to clothe yourselves with the Lord Jesus and do not think about how to gratify the desires of the flesh. As human beings, we're always living in the end times, whether the end times means the second coming of Jesus or our own, or our, or our own individual death. While it's much more dramatic and earth-shaking to talk about the end of the world as though our dying and God's end are one and the same, most likely your eternal salvation and mine will come along before the promised return of Christ in glory. At least that's what biblical history would suggest at this point in time. So Paul's advice was not to be distracted by the darkness of this world's political and legal nonsense, but rather to put on the armor of light. In Augustine's classic book, Confessions, he tells about his conversion to Christianity. In 386 AD, the son of a Christian mother and pagan father was deeply moved by a desire to break from his old lifestyle of immoral sin. As he, was, as he sat tired and weeping in his garden in Milan, Italy, suddenly he heard the voice of a child singing Tole Lege, Tole Lege, translated take up and read, take up and read. He picked up a scroll lying next to him, and his eyes fell upon this passage in Romans 13, verse 13. Let us behave decently as in the daytime, not in carousing and drunkenness. Rather, clothe yourselves with the Lord Jesus Christ, and do not think about how to gratify the desires of the flesh. Immediately, says Augustine, my heart was flooded with a clear light, and the darkness and doubt vanished. Within 25 years of Paul's letter, God's people in Jerusalem would be subjected to one of the most horrifying military slaughters in world history. The Jewish historian Josephus says that over a million people, mostly Jews, were killed during the Roman siege of Jerusalem. The temple was flattened with not one stone remaining on top of another just as Jesus had precisely predicted and the Jewish people were chased out of Israel for the next 2,000 years. All the Romans left behind was rubble and portions of the temple wall. Had it not been for Jesus' warning in Matthew 24, few Christians would have, accept, would have escaped this horrible slaughter, but as history records, the disciples listened and they lived. The bottom line is this. Despite our occasional dissatisfaction with government, it's important for believers to accept civil authorities as ordained by God so long as they don't interfere with our obligation to Christ and to Scripture. As it has occurred on a number of occasions lately, with the legalization of abortion on demand and same-sex civil rights, Christians must do as Paul instructs in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 15, to speak the truth in love so that we'll grow to become in every respect the mature body of him who is the head that is Christ, 
From him the whole body, joined and held together by every supporting ligament, grows and builds itself up in love as each part does its work. God bless you, and God bless Calvary Baptist Church.